Go to um, John chapter 4. Let me move through the scripture. Um, Lift my wife up in prayer. Um, Her and I spent the week in Arizona. Um, Families going through some really, really traumatic stuff down there with the uh, judicial system, federal government. So um, we're just praying for victory. We're praying for justice. We're praying that the good Lord would just be God in the midst of that. So lift her up in prayer. Very uh, emotional time for them right now as they're kind of going through the storm that God would be glorified in it all. Amen? Amen, amen. So John chapter 4, let me um, pray, and I'm trying to figure out how to begin this thing so we can kind of go to what I really feel the Lord is laying on my heart this morning. Holy Spirit, um, we're praying for preaching power. We're praying for strength to be able to say what you would have us to say. Uh, Most of all, as we continue this process of resolving to change, this is the fourth week we've been on this subject matter in working towards achieving breakout, that God, you would permeate our hearts, speak to us this morning, that we would see ourselves in this passage, God, to be all that you would have us to be. So we bless you, we praise you, we worship you in your name, we give you praise and honor. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, to achieve breakout, you must resolve to change. Other neighbor real quick. Say, other neighbor. To achieve breakout, you must resolve to change. Now, we've been dealing with the subject of resolving to change for the first month as we're laying foundation for what we're going to be doing throughout the entirety of the year. And what I'm learning about the premise of this is the statement that I've been making every single week thus far, and that is you cannot stay where you are and expect to grow with God. Anybody believe that this morning? Yeah, an encounter with God is going to cause us to change and press us to do things differently to go to a different place with God. You just cannot stay where you are and expect to go and or grow with God. So far, we've looked at three men um, that encountered God and made the resolution or resolve to change that at the end of their encounter with Jesus, they ended up being a different person. Number one, it was the invalid by the pool of Bethesda. We saw him laying there dormant. Jesus showed up. He encountered Christ, and he did some different things in his life, pick up his bed and walk. Later on, Jesus saw him in the temple and said to him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. We, we studied that. We saw it quite well. Then we saw blind Bartimaeus the following week where Bartimaeus in, um, was waiting for an opportunity to meet God. And the moment he got that opportunity, there was nothing that could deter him from reaching out to Christ. We saw that God did some work with him. Last week, we started to come closer to the church when we encountered Nicodemus. Come on, say Nicodemus. The thing that I liked about Nicodemus is Nicodemus was not an invalid, nor was he waiting for opportunity. He took the initiative to go find out. Amen. And sometimes we need to take that initiative. And what I liked about the text, and I said this last week as we transition, is that in all three instances, it didn't matter where the people were in their journey, Jesus met them where they were. That ought to give me one amen, y'all. I, I thank God that he has a way of meeting us where we are. Come on, that's, that's good news. That's good news. Because some of us are too afraid to go to him. Don't worry about it. He'll show up. <laughs> Yeah, he will, he will show up, and that's good news, that's good news in that. Lest my female members call me chauvinistic, um, I feel I better add a lady to the list. <laughs> Amen? I wanted to add a lady to the list, so today I want to continue my journey in the book of John and jump down to John chapter 4, and I want to look at a very, very popular woman. Um, And I'll move around the text because I just want to point out some things as we talk about resolving to change, um, to get to where we must get to the place of worship with God so we can be all that God would have us to be. Now, here's what I'm learning as we kind of look into the text as I've been studying this lady now for a a few. um, This is what I'm learning. And before I make this statement, don't nobody be so arrogant as to fool themselves into thinking that they've already arrived. Is that a fair statement? I was sharing with the ministry team this morning um, at altar call, I feel I need to be the first one (laughs) at the altar. I'm just going to say it because I know I'm not not there. Um, I am pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you think you're there, maybe you should have been on the cross in place of Jesus. 
right? Amen. We're all trying to get there, Pastor D. Um, so here, here's, here's a statement that I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, is that the reason we're not where we should be, and, and, and listen to me carefully as I say this, is that there are things in our life that avoid, if I could use the term, that keeps driving us back to the place to try to fill this or quench this thirst that we have. Are you with me? And we keep going back to a place to try to get the, the, the thirst quenched, but the place that we go to cannot quench the thirst. Only a true worship of God can fill the void. I want you all to hear me. Nothing in the world could quench the thirst in your life. If you get a nice car thinking that'll fix it, you'll go buy another one. If you get a good wife or a husband, you think they can fix it, after about three days, you'll be sick of them. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, married folks, just say amen. Yeah, you know, don't say it too loud as she's sitting next to you. But... <laughs> Yeah, or he, or you kind of get what I'm saying. But, but there's nothing in the earth that can fill the void. And when it comes to us encountering God, here's how I'm going to say this. Before God gives you all of him, he will press you to bring the thing that you've been replacing him with. Yeah, he'll press you to bring the thing that you've been replacing him with and challenge you to lay that at his feet at the altar then he can begin to work in you. I wish I had somebody. Yeah, so we'll walk through this. I want us to walk through this in the text because I have some things in my life that if I'm honest with myself, as we talk about resolving to change and I'm trying to set up making the transition to break out worship, that I need to lay those things at the feet of Jesus. And if I'm honest with you, I like it so much, I don't know I'm ready to lay it down. Y'all have to preach out. Come on, y'all. Just say, you know, we, you, we, we, we all have that. So you're talking about me too, preacher. Yeah, you're talking about me too. Yeah, let's just be honest about it. We just have a bunch of holy people that we're going to work through it to kind of deal with it. Um, just for the holy folk. There is none righteous. No, that. <laughs> all we like sheep have gone astray. First John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And, okay, let's go to work. Enough of that. John chapter 4. Let me show you this. Okay. John chapter 4. And now we're going to encounter this woman that Jesus met by the well of Samaria. Now, let me just read verse 1, and then we're going to read the text, and I'll talk through it and share what I need to share so God could move and have his way. Verse 1. If you're at verse 1, say amen. amen. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, Now when Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Now, verses 4 through 6 gives us some pertinent information as it relates to the location and details that I need you to pay very, very close attention to that we'll come back and talk about. Now, look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay? And so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the, field, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And then the author puts in there, it was about the sixth hour. Whenever you get that level of detail in a text, it's there for a reason and I don't want us to overlook the importance of the detail. Come on, say he had to go through Samaria. Now, let me just give you this little bit of uh, historical, cultural stuff, then we're going to walk through the text. Now, the normal route from where Jesus was to Galilee, the, the, the most direct route was through Samaria. But the problem with going through Samaria is certain neighborhoods, certain folk didn't walk through. Let that do what that needs to do. Are you with me? <laughs> Depending on what side of the fence you were, you work through certain neighborhoods. So it just so happened that the Jews and Samaritans were at conflict with each other. They were not the best of friends. They lived on opposite side of the tracks. And the laws of the day, specifically the Jewish tradition, would separate the two and they would not have relationship with each other. So any good Jew who wanted to go to Samaria would begin the journey. Then they would cross the Jordan on the east side and go way 
out of their way on the east side of the Jordan to get to Samaria. Now, being the good Jew that Jesus was and that his disciples was, walking with his disciples, their natural inclination was to follow the path that most church folk would take. But here's what Jesus said, just like we saw with Bartimaeus, just like we saw with the invalid at Bethesda, just like we saw with Nicodemus. If Jesus can take a shortcut to get to you, he'll do it all day long. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. So the text says that Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. And, and lest I move on, I am still thankful that God stopped by where I was long enough just to draw me into a relationship with him. And if you know God this morning, you ought to be thanking him that he went through Samaria just to meet you. Come on, don't act like you hadn't done anything. We ought to be thanking God that he went through Samaria just to meet us. So he had to go through Samaria because God had a mission. God had a purpose. God had a woman that had a thirst that she could not quench that kept her going to a place all by herself because she was a societal reject. And Jesus wanted to encounter her to bring her to a relationship with him. Verse four, he had to pass through Samaria. So notice what it says. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Now, here's what I want you to, to lock into the text, and there's a lot of detail, and we're gonna talk through this. He didn't actually make it to Samaria yet, because if you read the story, it says that his disciple had gone into the town to buy food. So this is a region or a vicinity outside of Samaria in this little village called Sychar. Come on, say Sychar. He, he, he went to this place called Sychar. Now look at the details of the text, and we're going to come back and talk about it. And here's what the author says about Sychar. It was located near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And then verse 6 says, Jacob's well was there. Okay? Very, very important religious, historical, cultural information that paints a picture that we're going to see later on. And so notice what it says. He was tired from his journey, sitting beside, and he sat beside the well, and the author says it was about the six hours. Say 12 o'clock in the afternoon. 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You're not going to say like you become. 12 in the afternoon. Then say in the desert. One more time. Say 12 in the afternoon. In the desert. 12 in the afternoon in the desert, nobody goes outside. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Especially women. Mess your hair up. Mess your neck. You know, you tell the husband, you better go get. Come on, y'all. Especially women. So notice the author now introduces new details into the text. He says, it just so happened at 12 in the afternoon in the desert, in this location, uh, the region of Samaria by Sychar, look at verse 7, a certain Samaritan came to draw water, okay? By virtue of the time, by virtue of the region, by virtue of the location, without even giving us explicit detail, John is painting a picture. This woman had some issues. She needed to change some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give this away, then we're going to see it in the text as we kind of walk through it. Everything in the text points to the fact that the woman was a societal reject. She had problems because the normal culture dictated that early in the morning, the women would come together as a group, and before the sun even got up or before it got hot, they would go out and fetch water for the day and bring it back to their home so they can have enough water there. She had a problem. So all of a sudden, the women are back home. When nobody is there, she shows up to this well all by herself because she did not have any friends, and let me say this now, because none of the ladies trusted her around their husbands. <laughs> she did change some things. Come on, ladies. Y'all know that as soon as you see her talking to him, you'd be like, you better stay away from that one. <laughs> She needed to make some adjustments, so she had some issues. Twelve in the afternoon, this lady shows up at the wrong time of day to get water, and then notice what the text says. She shows up there, and then she got the shock of her life. A Jew is sitting in a place that he ought not be sitting in a region that he has no reason being in 
by a well that he's not authorized to sit at because the cultural norm said Jews don't come to this one. Shock of her life. Wow. Look at what it says. Jesus said to her, give me a what? Give me a what? Let me, let me just say this and let the Spirit do what it wants to do with this. I've been processing just that phrase for the past couple of weeks, and I've come to the conclusion that Jesus has been asking me, and he's been asking you for a long time for a drink, but we've been giving him the wrong thing. Do whatever you want to do with that. We'll come back to that in the upcoming weeks as we go into worship. Because worship is all about giving him a... I'm going to let that go. There's a parenthetic in verse 8. The, authors, the, the, the disciples gone into the city to buy food. And in case you didn't know the details of what was going on, look at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew... Ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. And just in case you didn't know the historical cultural stuff, the phrase says parenthetically, Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Let me tell you how bad this thing was. This thing was so bad that there was Jewish laws that were written that says Jews could not eat at the same table with Samaritans. There were laws that were written that said Jews could not drink from the same utensils as Samaritans. Jews could not sit at the same table and share a meal with the Samaritans. Matter of fact, there were laws that were written that says Samaritan women were so defiled that Jewish men could not interact with them. Now, what I need you not miss in the text that Jesus was not an ordinary man. He was a rabbi. Are you with me? And, and so here's the thing, here's the thing, and if you know about this biblically and historically, culturally, um, folk, most of the old patriarchs that met their wives met them at a well. Y'all going to do your work. Come on, I'm Moses, and hey, y'all know this stuff. All those people, are you with me? So there's some stuff that normally happened. Yeah, I'm glad y'all said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jesus risked his reputation being at the well and then let alone while at this well to engage a Samaritan woman in dialogue. If anybody had saw that conversation, that would not look good for Jesus. Bad stuff going on. Bad blood had set. And so here's what this woman said to him. Man, how is it that you, a Jew, are asking me and a rabbi on top of that for water to drink, okay? Now, I like the let's play because I want to get to some place with this. Look at what it says in verse 10. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, Lord have mercy. Y'all going to hear this in the upcoming weeks. We say we know God. We really don't know who God is. We, it's, we'll, we'll explain it. We'll work through it, okay? If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have done what? Giving you what kind of water? What kind of water? Okay, very, very important, very, very important. I'm just going to skim this because I want to get to what I want to talk to. Verse 11, the, word, the, the, the lady said to him, woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Okay, so here, here's what you Let me just say this, and then we're going to move on. That well, commentator said, was probably about a hundred feet deep or more. And the norm is when a traveler or a sojourner was going on their journey, they would normally have a leather bucket that was tied to a rope. Whenever they got thirsty and they encountered a well, they would lower the thing into the well and draw the water and drink. And she surveyed Jesus. And I think the reason the author gave us the parenthetic that his disciples had gone into town to buy meat, they probably took the bucket with them. Do whatever you want to do with that. So she's looking at Jesus. Okay, we have, how, how do you plan <laughs> to get this water? Now, listen to what she says. Are you God or something? Y'all probably, where, where in the world is he seeing that statement? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who was the source of this well? 
the one who gave us this well and his descendants drank from it and their animals themselves, are you, are you greater than he is? And if I'm Jesus, I'm giggling on the inside, girl. I spoke and the well came into existence. You know what I mean? If, if I'm Jesus right about now, I want you all to see this. And she's challenging him, are you greater, verse 12, than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his son and his livestock. I'm coming back to that, okay? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will do what? This is where we want to go to work. Turn your neighbor real quick. Say, neighbor, the reason you're thirsty is you're drinking the wrong water. Ah, Lord have mercy. Look at verse 14. But whoever drinks the water that I give him, Jesus said, will never be what? Thirsty what? Again, and look at what Jesus says, the water that I give or give them will become in them a well, a, a spring of water welling up into eternal life. I'm going to come back to that. Verse 15, the woman said, well, heck, hook a sister up. Straight up. Let's fix this right now, okay? Because, because what Jesus did that I don't want you to miss is Jesus did not beat around the bush and he didn't flirt with the situation and play with her. He went right to the heart of the matter because he realized the reason that this woman kept coming to this well at this time of day was because of an unfulfilled need in her life that she kept coming to try to replenish and she was covering up a problem versus fixing the problem itself. And here's how I said it in my introduction. The reason I keep going back, I keep doing the things that can't meet or fill the void in my life is because at the heart of all of that, there is something that I need to resolve to change, something I need to turn, something I need to do differently, but I keep covering it up with the surface stuff. But when the surface stuff wears out, I get thirsty all over again and I go back. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. The reason a lot of us are stuck where we are is because of a thirst that we cannot quench and we fool ourselves into thinking the wells or the waters of the world can quench the thirst and they cannot. <sighs> come on, say amen if you hear me this morning. They cannot, they cannot, they cannot. Notice what Jesus said to her. Let's read that again. She said this. Um, Jesus said, everyone, verse 13, who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give them will what? Never thirst again. And don't miss this, don't miss this. The water that I give him will become where? In him a spring of water welling up into what? Now, just like Nicodemus, this woman is so focused on the literal that she's missing the spiritual implications of what Jesus is trying to say to her. How can a man be born again, Nicodemus, right? And enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. So where are you going to get this water? Give me this water because I have a problem. I have a thirst. I have a situation that's going on in my life that has me coming here in the desert at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and I think it's about the water. <laughs> and Jesus says, let me say it this way so y'all don't miss it. When I get done with you, what I do to you, what I will do to you, no physical water. You will be able to tap into something, tap into something. Listen to how I'm going to say it. Every time the need surfaces and that thing that I deposited in you, Guaranteed to fill the need regardless of whatever it is. If you look at the Greek word for well that's used in the text, it's the word that we translate sometimes cistern. And what that means is that the authors are trying to connote or imply to us that underneath of that well, it has a source that continually feeds the well. 
You wonder why hundreds and hundreds of years later this well hadn't run out. The reason they gave you all the data up in verse 6 is because this is not a freshly dug well. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on. This is not something that just showed up. So Jesus is trying to say, just like you keep coming to this place where its source never runs dry, let me put the same thing in you such that the source never runs dry, that when the thirst, the thirst surfaces, you can tap into the well and deep inside of you, you'll be able to create your own set satisfaction for the thing that's making you thirsty. Boy, some of y'all look at me like me crazy. Let me just say this right now, and in two weeks from now, you're going to get it. Oh, the importance of worship. (laughs) It's like a spring. Oh, the importance of worship. See, the problem with you and the problem with me is we've equated worship to a song. And we've equated worship to a location. And we've equated worship to a position. And we've equated worship to some liturgical process that we have to go through. The raising of the hand, the opening of the mouth, making some kind of something. But we don't see worship to be something that lives in us. And because we don't see it to be something that lives in us, here's what we do. We go in and out of worship. And we come to church waiting for the team to fire us up. And we'll even say crazy thing like this. God ain't here today. (laughs) Because we don't know how to allow the spring in us to produce water. Y'all all right? Y'all all right? You got to be able to tap into the spring. Oh, assuming you have it. safe assumption, right? Because if it ain't there, ain't going to produce no water. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I want to get somewhere with this. The woman said to him, verse 15, give me this water that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw. So if you have, Jesus, if you are able to give me, to deposit in me a source that can help me change my condition. You all remember this, right? that it can also change my location and give me a new, yeah, thank you for listening to me, a new occupation, give it to me now. Now, let's switch, and I I I probably won't get far with this because I don't want to lose anybody. Now, listen to this. Sure, I have no problem giving it to you. Go call your husband. You want to resolve to change? But you can't stay where you are and grow with God. (laughs) I need to change some things in you for me to work, for the spring in you to work. Oh, I wish I had somebody. (laughs) Change some things. Come on, say that a lot. Say it with me. Say, change some things. Go call your husbands. Now, listen to this. Here's her response. Let's read, let's read, let's read. Verse 16, go call your husband, and don't miss the phrase, and what? Okay, see, because a lot of us overlook that simple phrase because we've been in church for so long. All we know Jesus to say is go call your husband, and we stop there, okay? Now, here's what I need you to know. Jesus was not sending her away never to return. The implication in the text is, I'll be here when you get back. Oh. (laughs) That's the implication of the text because of all the data that was given to us, right? So go call your husband and look at the conjunction which connects the two together and come where? So in other words, I'm going to sit right here while you go bring those boogers and come back, we can do what we got to do. Is this, is this plain enough, guys? Say, go and come back. One more time, say, go and come back. Okay, now, now, now that I have your attention, look at what she says. 
Um, she says, I have no husbands, Jesus said to her. And look at what Jesus said. I mean, the woman said to Jesus, and look at his response. You are right in saying, I have no husband. And then I love the grammatical nuances in the verbal phrase. You have had. You see now why she came at 12 because none of them sisters, mm-mm. You can take Sally's, you can take Betty's, but I'm hanging on to mine. And woe to those women whose husband you have taken, okay? And I like the last phrase, and the one you have now is not your husband. <laughs> now, if I'm her, I'm embarrassed. I'm, uh, come on, y'all, come on, come on. Because the whole reason she went there that late in the day is because she wanted no one to know about her business, about her situation. She wanted to be secretive and clandestine about what she was doing, and she got busted. Busted by a person that don't even know her, a traveler, a sojourner. Come on. Now, let me say this to you, and I'm going to say it to myself as well. Just in the event that we fool ourselves into thinking that Jesus doesn't know what we do while we're at home, stop it. <laughs> let me... Uh, just in case, just in case, just in case we have fooled ourselves into thinking that, that we're doing this in secret and he knows nothing about it, not only is he saying to this woman, go call your husband, this morning he's saying to me and he's saying to you, go call yours. Now, here's why Jesus said you've had five, then I'm going to wrap this up. I want to get to this one point. The Jewish law also said that the maximum amount of time a woman can get married and remarried is three. So he's like, lady, you passed grace. <laughs> You're like jacked up, jacked up. Okay, you're so jacked up that, that if you were to translate the word aner, which is husband, to mean, uh, could be man or husband, to mean husband, that you've passed the allowable laws such that marriage don't mean nothing to you no more. This is how I'm going to say it, that you've resorted to living with men outside the bounds of marriage. I'm going to hurry up and leave this point alone so y'all can come back, all right? Because some of us have done the same thing. Let's try it out first because marriage don't mean what it means and we're living outside the bounds of, I wish. Uh, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone because, you know, let, let God do his thing. I got to hurry on past this point because I want y'all... <laughs> I want, I, want, I want to come back, okay? Your value system is so jacked up, lady, that you violated what the law has said, and you've gone two outside, and the third one has not. I don't even know if grace is going to work for you anymore. <laughs> if you were to translate an air as just men, lady, you've got a sexually addictive problem. You're living in fornication, and fornication has become your cultural norm, and it means nothing to you. If I'm sitting there and Jesus tells me this stuff, put me in the well. <laughs> it's some, come on, y'all. This is embarrassing stuff. Put her stuff out there, okay? Now, the reason I think that it's paramount and that is important is because you can't stay where you are and grow with God. If we're going to be honest with God and we're going to resolve to change, we need to quit hiding things because he already knows. Go ahead and lay it on the altar and allow the change to take root in our lives. Come on, say amen if you're hearing me, okay? Now, now watch this, watch this, watch this, okay? And what you said is true. Now, here's the switch. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a... This is... Okay. I need y'all to pay attention. Don't listen. Don't miss this. Okay? Very, very important stuff. I perceive that you are a prophet. Somebody sent from God. So that means it must be safe for me to expose myself in the presence of Listen to the, watch how, this, watch how the text transitions. I perceive that you are a prophet. Remember, before it happens, go call your husband and bring him to me. I ain't got none. Yeah, you do. Quit lying. Let's just deal with this up front. Okay, okay, you bust me. Um, so I see now that you are a prophet. So let me say it this way, 
and then I will show it to you in the text. When I bring them back, where do you want me to meet you? Are y'all looking at me like, what in the world? Now let's work it out. Verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers worship where? On this mountain. But you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to what? Look at verse 21. Jesus said to her, Lord have mercy, this is some stuff. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now, what? Here. When what kind of worshipers? True worshipers will worship the Father how? In spirit and how? In truth. For the Father is seeking what? Such worshipers to do what? Worship him. Verse 24. God is what? Spirit. And those who worship him must worship what? Now, before she leaves the scene, verse 25 is important. The woman said to him, hey, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, look at what Jesus said to her. Who do you think you're talking to? Okay, now, now I'm going to explain this. She leaves the presence of Jesus. Jump all the way down to, and then let me explain, to verse, um, where it is, um, 39. You guys are there? Many Samaritans from that town believed in what? Because of the what? Is everybody there? Verse 39. He told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans came where? You, you notice they came back. They came back. So when they came to him, I need to say this, okay? Um, it says, when the Samaritans came to him, verse 40, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed with them, what? And look at verse 41, and many more believed because of his what? They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Enough of that. Back up to verse, um, um, back up to verse, where is it at? Okay, 19. Say, go call your husband. Real quick. Say, go call your husband and come back. Now, let me, let me summarize. Let me wrap this up. Verse 19. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And listen to how I'm going to say this. In the vein of going and call your husband, the conversation of worship ensued. Okay. Now, if you remember with me, if you were to go back to verse 6. Well, jump back to verse 6 real quick. Let me show you this. I want to read this and I want you all to see this. Okay. Verse 4. And then we're going to read, he had to pass through Samaria. Say amen if you're there. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Jacob, um, Jacob, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weird of his journey, was sitting beside the well. That's not free information, pertinent information, okay? So now, here's what I need you all to understand with me. Where Jesus was sitting was near to the vicinity of, of the religious worship for the Samaritans, okay? If you were to go to the book of Genesis, you would find way back in the book of Genesis, J uh, when, when, when Jacob was on his sojourn, he had bought a piece of land from Nahor, I believe it was the Amorites, and he gave that land to his son Joseph. And you remember with me, when Joseph went to Egypt and that Joseph died, they returned his body all the way from Egypt to this exact location, and they buried him there, okay? Abraham, she said, our father Abraham. So you can see the descendants, and you can see the lineage, and you can see the division that happened between the Jews and the Samaritans. So here's what you need to know about the text. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, this place meant something to the Samaritans. Joseph's body was there. Joseph was the guy who delivered them from Egypt. Come on, y'all know this. Come on. I mean, Jacob had bought the land, so this land had great significance, and this had been the church that her great, 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 great grandmama used to attend. 
There was value there. So she wasn't about to change church. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Come on, y'all know the text. I mean, this is the place where we go, but we've got a problem. I hear what you're saying, and I need to bring some things to you. When I come back, where do I meet you? Because a lot of us don't know where to meet God yet. And, and here's the, the conversation. Worship. Come on, say worship. Say it again. Say worship. If you were to do some etymological studies on the word, you'd find two words that, that connotes or def- as translated as worship. Number one is the Greek word proskuneo, and number two is the Greek word latreo. Now understand with me, these were near Old Testament folk. So when you mention worship to them, they're thinking the Old Testament cultic system. I've got to go somewhere, I've got to bring something, and I need to bow and off. I wish I had somebody in here, and I've got to offer that thing. The Greek word proskuneo, what it means is that when I am in worship, I bow, and I pay homage, and I blow kisses to the one that I am adoring. The word latreo means that the fruits of my labor, the work that I do, the thing that I do, the first fruit of that thing, I bring it that as I am pressed to nail on God, I offer it on the altar. I wish I had somebody in here of sacrifice. So in her mind, I'm going to get Tom, James, Derek, not that one. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get all these guys, and I'm going to come back. And, and do I meet you in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerasim? Because I need to bow myself before you and offer before you the thing that had me coming to the well in the first place. Oh, I need two witnesses in here that know what I'm talking about. I need two witnesses in here. So, so when I bring my sin, when I bring my issue, when I bring my stronghold, when I bring the thing that has me bound, the thing that keeps me thirsty, the thing that keeps me coming back to the well, the thing that has given me a bad name, the thing that has ruined my character, when I come back, where do I meet you? I wish I had somebody in here. And Jesus goes into this discourse. Hey, lady, it's a new day coming. The cultic system is being torn down. Woo! Lord, have mercy. He says, because the father, that's pater in the Hebrew, the I am that I am, the one who didn't start nowhere, the creator, the almighty God, the one who speaks things into existence, when you worship him, since he is spirit, ha! Worshippers, must worship him not in a location. Ooh. Not with a song. Not with a dance. Not with any liturgical format, but in spirit and truth. So listen to this. It really doesn't matter where you bring them, just bring them. And I will receive them wherever because I might be in Jerusalem with you. I might be in Samaria with you. But if you're coming to worship, you've got to lay down the thing that keeps you coming back to the well that can't do the, 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 that can't fulfill the need. Because remember, when you bring it, I'm going to deposit in you a source. Ah, listen, y'all, I'm done with this, but I want y'all to hear this. If the source is in you, the physical worship environment can't do nothing to mess up your worship. If the source is in you, the worship leader can do nothing to mess up your worship. If the source is in you, 
It doesn't matter whether you lead a song or not. That can do nothing to mess up your worship. I wish I had somebody in here. If the source is in you, it doesn't matter whether the lights are up or lights are down, that doesn't impact your worship. If the source is in you, it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, it has nothing to do with your worship. If the source is in you, it doesn't matter whether you're sick or healthy, broke, rich or poor, it does nothing to impact your worship. If the the source, I wish I had somebody up in here. If the source is in you, it doesn't matter what your situation is because God is spirit and he's looking for true worshipers. If you need to be seen to worship, you don't have the source. Are you hearing me? If you need to be heard to go into worship, you don't have the source. Ah. This is why Paul can say, brothers, I've learned in whatever state I am to be what? Yeah. Yeah. But you cannot omit those husbands. They got to come with you to worship. Because when they show up in worship, you bow down and place them on, yeah. That's your reasonable sacrifice. Now you know why Paul said to the church at Rome, brothers, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your what? How? As living what? Sacrifice, holy, and pleasing to God. So this is what it really ought to look like. If this is the altar, you come and you bow down, and when you get down, you better lay your happy little behind on the altar. Come on, come on, I want y'all to hear me. So this is why I said to you, man, when I research this text, I feel like I need to be, yeah. Because if I'm not on the altar, what am I going to give him? If I'm not on the altar, I'm going to look for problems, and I'm going to say, you need to be at the altar. You, no, no, I need to be. I am the sacrifice. If I'm on the altar, all my husbands, my wives, my everything is laying there with me. And they are my latreo, my reasonable service to God. And when God deposits in me, we're going to talk about this later, that well of water springing up into eternal life. Man, let me connect this to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh last week is what? That which is born of the Spirit is what? Marvel not, Nikki Boo. <laughs> you must be born again. I need you to make the transition from flesh to spirit because flesh does not have a well on the inside. So flesh has attitude. Flesh gets angry. Come on, come on. Flesh looks at people. But the spirit locks into God, and God does his work, and the spirit is never in and out of worship. So when the enemy attacks the flesh, the spirit can stand firm and resist the enemy and give victory to the flesh. Come on, is this making sense? If we're going to get to break out, we must resolve to change. It begins by being filled with the spirit so we do not fulfill the desires of of the, f yeah. Bow your heads with me. Worship team, come on. God, you are awesome. Yes, yes, God, you are mighty. Spirit, break out. Break the walls down. Spirit, break out. Heaven, come down. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Flood this place, God. Fill the atmosphere. Your glory is what our hearts long for, God. 
just to be overcome by your presence. If we can get there with you, the things of the world, God, won't impact us as much. We'll be able to stand firm and say, Thus saith the Lord. We'll be able to rise above the situation. We won't need to go to the well by ourselves at the 12th hour. The result of this woman's conversion, God, is that she was now accepted by a town that initially rejected her. And she came back. She brought, she brought the whole town, God. So, Lord, we thank you for you, God. We thank you for you. We worship you. We worship you. We don't have to go to Mount Gerizim, God. We don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. You can meet us right where we are. If it's by the pool of Bethesda, if it's sitting by the road in Jericho, if it's by night like Nicodemus did, or even if it's at the well in the region of Samaria, you will meet us, God. So fill us afresh, God. This morning, we all lay on the altar of sacrifice. We're going to come back with our husbands so we can worship you. So we thank you, God. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you, God. Oh, how we love you.